Hello everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Uh, welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where we watch old 16mm films and pump water from our basement. Uh, if you lived in North Carolina, then you probably have a lot of water that you're dealing with today. Uh, and that's what happened, is uh, basement, um, if there's a lot of water, and there's like a flood warning then we get water in the basement and so we prepared for it uh, we don't have any films on the floor uh, everything is up high but it's just not great and this is one of the things that we are hoping to do is to uh, redo the basement so that it is uh, waterproof and has sump pumps built in and has ways to maintain moisture all that stuff um, but what that means is we have to move all the films out that are currently in the basement out. Um, so anyways, like I said, this has been a long time thing and we know about it and we've been, you know, working on ways to deal with it. And one of the things is we have shelving units and there's no films on the bottom. Um, so because it might rain. Uh, let's see, watching some 60 millimeter films. That last film was uh, Geometry. And it didn't have a soundtrack because it was raw footage uh, that was uh, then going to be edited into uh, a film about geometry. Um, and so you notice you might have seen like a clapboard um, or slate, as they call it, um, and some mistakes. Uh, yeah, so this is part of the Coronet collection that we've been scanning. All that stuff's off-site. So we have a bunch of films um, off-site. Uh, so, all right, uh, here's another Coronet film, and this one does have language. It, this is English on the Job, and it's part of a series, Listening and Speaking Skills. Enjoy. Well, okay, sir. Marge called in sick today, Sue. So Mr. Ellis says we should split table. Oh, okay. There's hardly a job where listening and speaking skills aren't important. To show you these skills in action, and to give you some idea of how to make good use of them, we're going to visit a few job locations. We'll start here at the filling station we saw before. This is Mr. Turner, the owner. Mr. Turner? Yes, can I help you? We're getting some ideas about listening and speaking skills. Can we talk for a minute? Sure. Take someone like your attendant over there. Oh, that's Don. Uh, he just started about well, a month ago, I guess. What about his listening and speaking skills? Well, that's pretty much why I got the job. Well, sir, you're down about a sport. Okay. When he came to see me about the job, I liked the way he talked right from the start. You know, there's a difference in our work between saying to a customer, what's yours, bud, and saying, good morning, sir, would you like a tank full of premium? His attitude was good, too, and he sold himself. Well, it's like I told you over the phone. I'll be able to start working any shift, but I guess I should tell you I don't have a lot of garage experience. Well, I, of course, couldn't expect a young fellow like you to have... I liked his honesty, and he asked pretty good questions about the job, and that showed me that he was really interested in it. Well, Don, I think we'll start you out on the driveway. I need you out there first. And then, after you've had a little experience, I can get you into the garage so you can learn about the shop work. Sounds great. I know I can sell gas and oil, and I learned a lot about engines when I rebuilt this old jalopy last month. A friend of mine had this jalopy, swore it'd never run again. Well, that's good. Don. So Don told you enough about himself to convince you that he could do the job. In some job interviews, you have to talk to more than one person. 
Did Don see anyone else besides you? He saw Bill, our mechanic. He runs the place when I'm off. What did Don say to him? Well, he pretty well told Bill what he told me, the truth about himself. And I'm sure he listened carefully to make sure both of us agreed on what he'd be doing. I was wondering, what kind of work do you think I'd be doing? Well, Don, right now, you'd be mostly outside. But don't worry about not getting a shot at the garage, because it gets mighty busy. Maybe I can help you by showing you around. So, what you're saying is, if you see more than one person when you apply for a job, don't contradict yourself and make sure the people you talk to agree on what your job will be, right? Well, that way everyone knows where he stands. So listening and speaking skills are important in getting a job. But of course, that's not where they end. Let's visit this construction site near Don's gas station and see how these skills are important on the job. Jim? Jim? What listening and speaking skills would you say are important on your job? I'd say uh, following and giving direction. Your training teaches you the trade, but uh, whether you're on the labor crew or driving a truck or uh, on a bulldozer, it's being able to follow and give directions that uh, makes a man good on a job like this. Anything special you do, Jim, when you give instructions? Well, you have to think through what you say. And uh, you talk loud and clear, using words everyone understands. All right. Think it out. Organize it. Then say it so everyone understands. Is that it? Now you got it. I've seen entire sewer lines torn out or some fella get hurt just because some guy forgot to do just that. Why, the other day, the foreman was telling uh, Ted to have Frank move a pile of dirt back towards the site over there. Hey, Frank! Boss says move this pile of dirt back home. Ted tried to tell Frank to put the dirt back of the hole, but Frank thought he said back in the hole. We had to dig out the hole all over again. What about when you listen to instructions? Anything special you should do? Well, you uh, mainly listen to learn the procedure. But you also want to listen close to find shortcuts or, uh, or better ways to do something. Like the time the end loader broke down. Machine's down, Jim. We'll have to put you on something else. In the meantime, make out a shop ticket. OK, fine. Jim, this machine's going to be down for three or four days for repairs. In the meantime, why don't so you? So Steve figured for a big delay. But listening to him, I saw a way to save time. So until uh, this loader's fixed, I'll uh, I'll switch to. Hey, wait a minute! Isn't isn't Bob's crew done most of their loading already? Why don't we use one of their machines? Hey, Jim, real good idea. I'll check into it. Meanwhile, I'll make out the report. By thinking while he listened, Jim found a shortcut. That kind of careful listening is also important on Don's okay, job at the right. gas station. Okay, Don, Mr. Larson's car needs an oil change, a lube job, a tune-up, and uh, take a real good look at the brake. Good part. listening helps you get just about any job done right. Here at this restaurant, Helen is a waitress. Helen, we're talking about using listening and speaking skills on different jobs. What about on your job here in the restaurant? I didn't think there were any skills at first, but... Well, I found out there's more to listening than just using your ears. Helen. Excuse me. Helen, Marge called in sick today, so you'll have to split her tables with Sue. And uh, when you're not busy, would you try to help out at the counter, please? Okay. Which of Marge's tables should I cover, Mr. Ellis? Oh, yes. I guess I should have told you that. Why don't you take tables 10 to 15 over against the wall? Thinking while listening is important. I'm not afraid to ask questions when I don't understand. It's also a good idea to repeat what you've been told. You can save a lot of mistakes that way. 
like Sue's doing. Roast beef, medium well, one salad with French and two coffees. I'll get your coffee now. So you repeat instructions, and you ask questions about things you're not sure of. Just common sense. Listening and speaking are a basic part of Helen's job. Her work is a matter of communication with many people. But communication during a workday isn't always about your job. At a break, Steve and Jim are having a friendly talk. So are Bill and Don. Are speaking and listening skills important during these casual conversations? Well, let's go back to Helen's restaurant. It's a little later now. Ken, Joan, and Lou work together in a nearby office. They're on break. Let's listen in on their conversation. Oh, well, there was a great TV special on last night. There's never anything good on TV. Anyway, as I was saying, well, I Let me saw tell you something. I haven't seen a good program on TV in three years. Lou, would you please let Joan finish? Hey, I gotta get back early. Well, nice having coffee with you. I'll see you. Do you have coffee with Lou very often? Only when it can't be avoided. This uh, affects your working relationship, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does. After all, he never listens. He always interrupts. You don't make many friends on the job that way. Yeah, you're right. That kind of guy doesn't make friends on or off the job. So having good speaking and listening skills in casual situations means that you make contributions. You move the conversation along, but you give everyone a chance. That's just common sense, too. On many jobs, there are meetings of the employees. Those are good times for the workers to review their responsibilities and make suggestions. Good speaking and listening skills help you speak effectively to a group and be part of a group, too. Hi, fellas. Morning. Say, now that I've got you all together here, let's have that meeting that I told you about yesterday. Let's see, uh, Bill, how are things in the shop? Well, they're okay by my record. And uh, last week, the racks were pretty well filled. And with the cold weather coming on now, I think we have everything we need with the exception of Anderson. It seems that Bill is well prepared. He organized what he had to say ahead of time. Bill is doing something else very well. Call it emphasizing. Emphasizing is simply making the important words sound important. Listen. You know, I've been thinking, if we move Don to the racks uh, and we take Jack and have him cover the whole driveway, we'll be able to catch up all around. Notice that Bill also gave enough details to make everyone see why his comment was important. Don, what do you see going on? Well, I have noticed something, Mr. Turner. One important listening skill is being able to take suggestions. And the West Pump just had one car. I think if Jack and I helped spread the cars this week, moved cars to empty pumps, we'd probably be able to handle the evening rush a lot better. What are you talking about? Nobody told me to do that. Jack, will you tone down a minute? Don's making a good point. It's worth considering. From this meeting at the filling station, you've learned two things to do at any meeting. Make your points persuasively and politely the way Don did, and listen with an open mind, something Jack didn't do. So we've seen listening and speaking on the job. Oh, say, Don, you know, Bill is taking his two weeks vacation, and, uh... I think I'll give you a chance to run the shop. What do you say? Sounds great. Don's okay, listening and speaking skills are helping him move ahead. These skills are so important that they may cause you problems if you don't use them well. Ed, Frank says you told him to put that dirt back in the hole. No, I didn't. Try to suck me. You can develop and improve your listening and speaking skills on your job. It just takes a little thought and practice.
1972 had some awesome television programming, so I don't know what that guy's talking about. He didn't have to be such a grouse. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I have been uh, going through and uh, looking at comments that have been held for review. Uh, people have been saying, like, you're blocking me. Like, I don't see any of my comments. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? So I go look, and there's this new tab called Held for Review. And there's a bunch of innocuous messages in there. Um, so YouTube does sometimes go in and just says, like, yeah, I, I don't know. This is kind of iffy. So I apologize if you got caught in that. Uh, it happens, and you have to maintain it. But also I found in there some people just hate me. <laughs> like really are mad at what I do like why are you know you're putting up these crappy films and blah blah you know it's like dude don't watch you don't have to watch and they're like I don't know why you subscribe to this I'm like well then unsubscribe I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> this is what it is this is what we do um, I get it not everybody likes what I do I'm not going to be offended by that but like don't be so mad. Um, you know, if you don't like what you see, there's literally hundreds of millions of other choices. Um, so, anyways, uh, I, behind me I have a film scanner uh, where I'm going to show you a film that, you know, somebody out there is going to hate. So, it's kind of the nature of it. And I appreciate those who don't hate what I do, and I appreciate those who do appreciate even when the film is not great, and you guys acknowledge it's not great, it's uh, it's good. Uh, let me change the name of it. So there's a bunch of uh, uh, films that I have about things that are found in a wood shop or a mechanic shop. A uh, d description of different tools, and here is one such uh, film. This is the Combination Square. Enjoy. Man is a builder with a natural desire and an inborn knack for putting things together. Early in life, we find out there are a lot of problems in putting things together right. The pieces don't always fit the way we'd like them to. It takes practice and training. Before too long, we find out about square corners, angles and miters, curves and circles. And we discover the tools for making sure that the pieces fit together the way they should. Perhaps the most versatile and useful of these tools is the combination square. With this single all-purpose tool, we can lay out and check square corners and joints. or find the center of circles and cylinders. Within the limits of its size, its shape, and its accuracy, the combination square can be used for almost every type of exact measurement. The combination square is basically a specialized development of the elementary steel scale and consists of a specially designed blade and three removable, adjustable heads. The tri-square head, the protractor head, and the center head. The blade of a good quality combination square has an easy to read, non-glare satin finish. It comes in a variety of lengths and is marked off in inches and fractions of an inch like a standard steel scale. Each edge of the blade is graduated to a different degree of accuracy. On this side, eighths and sixteenths. And on the other side, thirty seconds and sixty fourths. The center slot in the blade serves as a track for the heads. Each of the heads contains a bolt assembly which acts as a guide for the blade. When the blade is reversed, the bolt assembly must also be reversed. The 
heads are locked on the blade by tightening this locking nut. The bolt assembly in each of the heads works in the same way. It's shown here with the center head. The most commonly used head attachment is the tri-square with its 90 degree square face, its 45 degree miter face, and the handy scriber for marking off layouts. To fit the head attachment and blade together, simply loosen the locking nut and slide the head onto the blade. The tongue on the locking bolt fits into the slot on the blade. If the head doesn't slide on the blade easily, don't try to force it. Check the alignment of the tongue and the slot. When the parts are properly lined up, they fit together easily. The locking bolt is reversible. That is, it can be rotated from one side to the other without removing it from the head. This means that the blade can be easily reversed without having to remove the locking nut and bolt. And this is a handy feature for changing from one graduation scale to another, say from the 16th scale to the 32nd scale. The other heads fit onto the blade in the same fashion as the square head. Let's look at that again, this time with a protractor head. Loosen the nut, slide on the head, lock it in place. With the protractor head, you can set any angle from zero to 180 degrees for laying out work or for measuring or checking angles. With the locking nut loosened, the face is free to rotate. To select an angle, say 32 degrees, Loosen the locking nut and rotate the revolving turret until the index mark is lined up with the second mark past the 30. That's 30, 31, 32 degrees. Now, hold the face steady and secure the head with the locking nut. And check the reading to make sure it's right after you tighten down. With the protractor head set to 32 degrees, you have set in a 32 degree angle between the edge of the blade and the face of the protractor head. You can also get a 32 degree angle in the other direction by turning the tool over. The angle remains the same. In addition to the 32 degree angle formed here, the angle formed here is equal to 148 degrees. The difference between 180 degrees, the full half circle, and the 32 degree angle set in here. Most protractor heads are provided with a second set of reverse degree markings to identify this second angle, called the supplementary angle. Any two angles which add up to 180 degrees are called supplements, and each time an angle is set in on the protractor head, two angles are formed. The angle you set in and the supplementary angle. Most commonly, protractor heads have a scale marked off in steps of one degree, with identifying numbers every 10 degrees, and a longer mark to identify the five degree point between numbers. Let's take the accessory heads for the combination square one at a time. The tri-square head, the protractor head, and the center head, and see how they are used to make actual measurements. The head you will use most often for most things is the tri-square head. To lay out square corners, the face of the head is placed firmly against the work. The blade forms a square line to the face, and the scriber is used to mark the layout. The square head is also useful in checking the trueness of square corner joints, especially where proper fit is important. You can use your square head to be sure the pieces will fit before they are put together.
Here is another example of how the square head is used to check work in progress. Here a craftsman uses the combination square to check this square joint before he joins the metal. He makes the necessary corrections, clamps the work down, and he's ready to go. After the joint is completed, he uses the square again to make sure everything came out all right. Let's take a look at this small assembly project. The drawing calls for these two pieces of sheet metal to be spot welded together. We need a one and a half inch right angle bend put in the vertical piece. And then it is to be joined at right angles to the base exactly two and three eighths inches from the edge and parallel to the edge. The first step is to check the square of the pieces and they're okay. Now he sets his combination square for one and a half inches. Removes the scriber and moves the tool along the edge of the work to scribe a line parallel to the edge and exactly one and a half inches from it. This shows him where to make the right angle bend. And of course he checks the bend to make sure it's square. By scribing a line parallel to the edge and just two and three eighths inches from it, he marks the point where the vertical wall is to be spot welded. He checks to be sure the joint is square and that the vertical wall is properly spaced from the edge of the base piece. And he clamps the pieces together ready for spot welding. And here is the completed job, exactly as specified. The miter face of the tri-square head is used exactly like the square face, except it is used for measuring and marking 45 degree angles instead of 90 degree angles. Use it for laying out mitered corners or for any application where a 45 degree angle is needed. The center head fits onto the blade in the same fashion as the tri-square head. The faces of the center head hold the tool in position so that the blade edge passes through the center of the circle. For a more exact location, scribe the diameter and then move the tool to a new point on the circumference and scribe a short mark across the diameter line. Where the lines cross is the true center. The technique is the same for cylindrical work. Position the faces of the head firmly on the circumference of the cylinder and scribe the diameter. Move the tool to a new position and scribe a cross line to find the center. The protractor head functions as a more versatile and more exact variation of the miter face on the square head. With a protractor head, any angle from zero to 180 degrees can be set in. For layout, the desired angle, in this case 50 degrees, is set in and the tool used to scribe the line as with the tri-square head. For measuring angles, the locking nut is loosened, the edge of the blade is held firmly against one face of the angular work, and the turret is rotated until the face of the protractor head is flush against the other face of the angle. The setting is snugged up by tightening the locking nut and the angle read from the protractor. In this case, 65 degrees. To transfer exact angular measurements, combine the measuring and the layout technique. Measure the angle, set the protractor, and with the desired angle set in, proceed to lay out an exact duplicate angle. A number of pieces of work can be checked for accuracy by setting in the correct angle and using the preset tool as a measuring standard. Like all precision tools, your combination square will give you better measurements when you give the tool proper care. 
Just keep the blade and the heads clean and protect your tool from water and dampness, which cause rust. Store it where it is protected from damage and handle it with reasonable care to keep from damaging or burring the surfaces. This then is your combination square, the most all-around tool on your bench. For layout, use your combination square to make perfect square corners or 45-degree mitered corners. A small spirit level mounted in the tri-square head can be used to check surfaces for level. To inspect, measure, or lay out any angle, the protractor head is what you need. Use it to measure unknown angles or preset a known angle for layout or inspection. Remember that every time you set in an angle, you also set in its supplement. Use the center head on circular flat work or cylindrical pieces. Find centers. Measure diameters. Do it all with one tool your combination square. Aircraft and missile, m missile films production? That's, what is that all about? <laughs> um, that goes beyond the normal uh, shop uh, film that I thought this was. This might be something that was made uh, to be sold and shown in uh, military industrial complexes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's kind of strange. It could also be that they were... Uh, Capitalizing on some grants, uh, able to get some money uh, that were that was being dedicated towards uh, science and development of missiles and air, aircraft. So who knows? Anyways, uh, I got a very nice thing in the mail from the kids, and uh, there is a drawing of me with nice anime eyes, and. Uh, um, and I've got a box of films. I'm very excited. Next to a Christmas tree. And... Uh-oh, I spilled some coffee. That happens. Happens all the time. So I'm very excited. There's Santa Claus. Uh, and then it just says, uh, Merry Christmas. Congratulations on 1,000 shows. Uh, thank you for all the content. Enjoy the cookies we made in school. So, it's very sweet. Um, yeah, those are the... Those folks... Um, Exciting, exciting. So let's see, what, I, what do I got? I got so many things I can show you. So many things. Um, there's the series that we've been showing, uh, the World Cultures and Youth. Uh, this one is Richard's Totem Pole, Canada. Enjoy. I think this one will do. Yep, I think this one will make a good pull. Well, this is the one we're looking for. My name is Richard Harris, and I'm 16 years old. I'm a Gitkison Indian. 
And my father, Walter, is a master totem pole carver and a hereditary chief of our clan. He's just been commissioned to carve a 30-foot totem pole, and he's asked me to help. I'd like to help my father, and he's very pleased. But I don't know if I'll be of much use. I've never carved before. In fact, sometimes I feel more like a cowboy than like an Indian. We live in the west of Canada, a large, beautiful country, where our people have been living for thousands of years. My village, Kispiox, has only 300 people and is half an hour north of Hazelton, the nearest town. Here, in the Rocky Mountains, the rivers and hills gave birth to trees now four to five hundred years old that are perfect for totem poles. Although, these old cedar trees are becoming scarce, and we had to travel a hundred miles from our village to find one. My father says that each totem pole tells a story and that nobody really knows how old the tradition is. Sometimes they're memorials to the dead and sometimes they express the feeling of our people that everything in nature is a different form of the same thing. What does that bottom figure mean there? Well, it's a... Uh... The pole we're starting tomorrow will represent our Gitkison people in the collection of the University of British Columbia. My father says he wants me to carve my own crest on the pole. I didn't even know I had a crest. He says it's both a spirit power symbol and a hereditary family emblem. He doesn't know mine since it's passed down through the mother's side, and I should ask her about my crest when she comes back from Vancouver on the weekend. The first step in making the pole is to strip the bark, after which we'll square the log. Finally, with my brother Rod's help, we shaped the front of the pole to prepare it for carving. Dad says my grandmother and some village elders will be at the graveyard this afternoon, and maybe they'll know about my crest.
My grandfather was a leading Gitkasan chief, and I don't know how long it's been since I last cleared the weeds from his grave. Alec and Sigurd. Clara Harris is my dad's mother, and though she's an expert on her family's crests, she doesn't know about my mother's line. Neither do Mary and Moses, who say that only my mother would know for sure. This morning, my dad said not to worry about my crest. He's sure my mother must know. But I'm not sure if it'll help me find the spirit of my people's traditions. Although we live in Kispiox, we work in nearby Kassan. When my father was young, the tribe had lost touch with its traditions. But by the 1960s, there was a rebirth of culture among Indians all over North America. It was then that our people built Kassan as a traditional village and a center for Gitkassan arts. The frog crest my father has decided to carve at the base of the pole represents the largest Gitkasan clan. Above that, the fireweed killer whale for dad's own clan, then the mosquito. And finally, he's leaving space at the top for my crest. Whatever it is, I'll have to do a strong design people can feel because it'll be 30 feet above their heads. Once Dad transfers the designs to the pole, we'll rough it in with power tools and then begin the carving. I've always loved watching my father work. He uses tools as beautifully and as easily as a painter uses a brush. My father says our work is going well, and soon he'll ask Chester to do a ceremonial grouse dance to inaugurate the pole before the fine carving begins. This afternoon, I can catch some salmon for tomorrow's barbecue. My mother will be home then, and I'll be able to ask her about my crest.
piece of truck out on the four lane a mile or more away. The whining of these wheels that makes them colder is an hour away from riding on prayers of in the car. Ten days on Like a fire softly burning, the suffers from the sun. It's alive in your eyes that makes me warm. My mom knows what my crest is. It's the white running wolf. And she says it has a long and proud tradition. She and Mary are very pleased I'm finally becoming interested in our ways, but caution me that to carve it well, I must really feel its spirit. Last night, watching the dance, I felt happy, and later the design of my crest came to me. My running wolf will be mounted horizontally across the top of the pole. My father thinks it's an excellent idea, and I'm very excited about it. My father says that in our carving, we must find the spirit in the wood and give it expression. And now, as I carve, I'm beginning to visualize the form my own crest must take. In just one week, the pole must be finished. I must start my crest tomorrow if it's to be ready. There'll be a big celebration at the university for the pole raising, and we're all going to be there. makes all his own chisels and adzes, which are the chopping hatchets we use. And he wants me to know how to keep them sharp, so every cut will be clean and precise. Carver, there's so much to know. My father has a feeling for wood that's taken him a lifetime to develop, and it's wonderful to be learning from him.
we're putting the finishing touches on the pole. And on my crest, too. And tomorrow, the truck will be here to take it down to Vancouver for the pole raising. How'd you get the...
what an exciting day. When I look at my running wolf at the top of the pole, I feel like that wolf is part of me. And when I put on the wolf mask, I feel like I'm part of the wolf. It feels like I'm beginning to understand how my people see the world. bump that control by accident. You'd be mincemeat by now. What have I told you? You don't work on equipment when the engine's running. Well, I told him not to touch anything. All right, I guess I wasn't thinking. You weren't thinking? You mean you'll work on engines and machinery and not think of your own personal safety? Here, shake hands with danger. Thank you. 
some friends I used to know Compared to them I'm lucky to be just Three Finger Joe <laughs> Um, so, of course, there were two separate films that dealt with heavy equipment, and I'm like, well, duh, I have to show Shake Hands with Danger, <laughs> the remix. Uh, so, yeah, uh, some of you called it, you knew, as soon as you saw it, the, and heard the beep, 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 you knew what was going on. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today, I uh, very much appreciate your eyeballs and your comments, um, and, uh, as I'm men said... Something that we heard in a film and I wrote down. And this is the immortal words of Michael Landon on the National Kids Quiz. Uh, remember to love each other and listen to each other. And uh, that sounds like great words. Uh, thanks. And we will see you tomorrow. Uh, this is episode 998. Uh, tomorrow is 999. Uh, then Wednesday is a thousand, but we're not really going to celebrate. I mean, we'll say that it's a thousand, but we're going to celebrate it on Saturday when we make, um, we do a thousand minute show and that will be, um, from 9 AM Eastern standard time to probably like two or two thirty or something like that. Um, and that's going to be the big marathon on Saturday. So, um, if I can't see you tomorrow, hopefully I will see you later this week. And hopefully um, I'll just join us on Saturday. Everybody take care. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.